huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Gail Thomas. There's so much uh, I'm going to only, or at least primarily, focus on her relationship with Jim Hillman and how that all came about. When I first came to the University of Dallas, uh, fresh from teaching phenomenological psychology at Duquesne University in Pennsylvania, and I was uh, walking on the mall and met Gail. And uh, Gail and Joanne at that time would meet weekly together to read and, and converse about Jung. Right? And I really didn't <coughs> have any, any exposure to Jung at all, I hate to say. But they invited me to join that reading group. The little, the, and as we read, that was my uh, in introduction to Jung in the most depth imaginable. Uh, several years after that, um, Jim first came to Dallas to, to uh, do a seminar for the Department of Psychology. And that led to a lot of conversation, and out of which came the first international conference on archetypal psychology. I mean, wonderful, extraordinary event with the most beautiful people, including, including Raphael Pedraza, Lopez Pedraza, and, and, and with Pat, so the, the three real founders of archetypal psychology, but many others from all over the world. And then it was out of that that the conversation began uh, concerning Jim coming to live in Dallas. And, and it happened, and it really happened very much you know, due to the work of Gail and, and certainly Joanne. Uh, well, it's not so well known, well maybe it is. That changed Jim's work completely, a completely different orientation where he, he became avidly interested in the soul of the world, in the soul of the city. And that, that was very much due to Gail and Gail's you know, work in, in, the, in the city. Um, the Jungian community doesn't quite like to look at that <laughs> because it's such a puzzling thing at first for, to move from you know, individual inner work to inner work with the, with the larger world and, and the city. So, um, yeah, Gail is involved and has been involved in, and has the capacity for administration, uh, writing, thinking. But her, her, her soul is poetic. Her, her soul is artistic and she writes poetry, has written poetry for many years and, and she's an extraordinary painter. So you have to somehow you have to put all this to together in your imagination of how, I mean, I can barely do one thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and she's doing all of these things, you know, leading, administrating, writing a, this extraordinary book on Pandora, uh, giving conferences, arranging conferences, take, taking care of Jim. That's not, was not an easy task. <laughs> used to drive him everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Please welcome Gail Thomas. We gather here today to seek the wisdom of the soul. In the, present, uh, in the preface of Animal Presences, James Hillman confesses I have been consistently trying to preserve in psychology that which Cartesian rationality fears and condemns. What is it that Cartesian rationality most fears and condemns? My sense is it is that union of soul and spirit in physical form. And I'm claiming it is the snake. The impregnation of soul by spirit. Impregnation. Now this is not a thought. 
It's not a concept. These are snaky things. Let's see how it works. We have a place in East Texas we call Wendover. We chose the name for this wooded retreat because we were inspired by a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins. The poem is called The Windover, Wind Hover, and celebrates a majestic bird hovering in his flight. Dapple dawn drawn falcon in his riding of that steady air underneath him and striding high there how he hung upon the rung of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy. Then off, off forth on swing. As a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend, the hurl and gliding rebuff the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of the mastery of the thing. Well, hearing that puts you in your high heart. And now hear this. It is a poem by D.H. Lawrence. Snake. A snake came to my water trough on a hot, hot day, and I in pajamas for the heat to drink there in the deep, strange scented shade of the great dark carob tree. I came down the steps with my pitcher and must wait, 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 must stand and wait for there he was at the trough before me. He reached down from a fissure in the earth wall in the gloom and trailed his yellow brown slackness soft bellied down over the edge of the stone trough and rested his throat upon the stone bottom and where the water had dripped from the tap in a small clearness he sipped with his straight mouth softly drank through his straight gums into his slack long body silently <coughs> Now notice how your body reacted. I'm certain everyone felt the same. The difference between the two poems is just physically palpable. My heart in hiding soared for a bird, the achieve of the mastery of the thing, versus a snake <coughs> came to my water trough on a hot, hot day to drink there. Well, I began my talk with images from these two poems, one of a majestic bird, the other a slimy, crawling thing, in order to evoke something within you other than a concept. No left-brained uh, uh, no left analysis, but just a bodily <coughs> sense. Amazing the power of image and what an animal presence does to the body, what it does to the body. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird. There's an exhalation, an outbreath, and then there's always the snake. What happens? Always, always fear comes, shock and fear. Now, this reaction is more than our Judeo-Christian education. It is, more, it is more than the Garden of Eden from Genesis, Adam and Eve, and the Tree of Knowledge, and there he is in the tree, the snake. And it's more than Moses, whose staff turns into a snake to threaten the Pharaoh to let my people go. It's more than Milton and Paradise Lost and the snake being the cause of it. It's more than our modern medicines, um, uh, physician staff with two snakes entwined. It's much, much earlier. From South American cultures, from the cave dwellers in the Nazco Plains. It's from Mesoamerica, Mexico, Almec, Mayan, Inca, Aztec, and their god, Coetzalcoatl, the winged serpent, 
and our Native American cultures, Shawnee, Comanche, Cherokee, Chaco Canyon, Anasazi cliff dwellers. The snake is there in the beginning. It's there earlier, much, much earlier in times on other continents, India and Eastern cultures. It's much, much more than Kundalini rising. It's there with Ouroboros, the snake biting its tail, much, much earlier. Earlier in Greek literature, earlier than Athena, who wears Erichthonius, the giant snake, wrapped around her shoulders. And the earlier king of Athens, he had a snaky tail. He ruled with his snaky tail. And on Athena's breastplate is Medusa with her snaky hair. Why? Why the snake? Is it perhaps because Athena's mother is Metis, who is wisdom itself? Is this wisdom snaky? Are snakes spirit creatures? Athena sprang from Zeus's head, and some early accounts say Zeus himself appeared as reptilian. What is snake? Well, why is it that Asclepius, the god of healing, carries a snake coiled about his staff? And why in the temple of healing, Asclepius's temple at Epidaurus, does the patient come, be given a room, ask to wait, 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 wait for the healing dream? And the healing dream is to be bitten by a snake. Why? What is it about the snake? Why is it that so many kings, queens, gods, and goddesses of ancient cultures are shown, depicted, with a snake's head on their crown? Giant serpents guard the doors of the great temple of Angkor Wat in Cambodia, where legend has it that at night the ruler ascends to the tower to couple with a woman who appears as a voluptuous female, but instead is a serpent with nine heads. Consider ancient Egypt, King Tut, Queen Nefertiti, Isis, and Osiris, all serpent-crowned. And it was believed that in Egypt the god Amun could regenerate himself by turning into a snake. It is said that the Naga of ancient India Tibet, Laos, and ancient China were descended from and ruled by kings and queens depicted as half human and half, snake, half serpent. It is as if the snake comes first and then the human. Or is it, to say it in a different way, at first appearances there is always the snake. Esoteric studies say this, snakes are the portal protectors. Now what does this mean, portal protectors? Snakes are always there in the beginning. Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden, it was as if the snake opens the door or guards the door or announces that the, go the door is open. Is this why the breaking edge of science today speaks of black holes as wormholes? I want in this brief time to evoke an essence of the phenomena of the wisdom of the soul, the union of soul and spirit, and how this union shows itself in all things and throughout all eons of what we call space-time. Now I say the essence of and the phenomena of the union of spirit and soul. Essence because I'm not wanting to form a concept. Instead if we just evoke a sense, a feeling, something that gives us goosebumps about this union, we will be in the midst of animal presences. Where did we get goosebumps? Bear with me here for a moment in this attempt to evoke an inner acknowledgement of this union. Somehow for me this is key to being able to receive on a visceral level 
this visceral level, what Hillman is asking us to be open to. It's not a thought. It's not a concept. What is it? Well, my sense is that it is the union of spirit, soul, and matter. What are these essences as words asking us to live viscerally? Viscerally. Snake. Spirit, soul, the impregnation of soul by spirit. How do we allow these words to collect within themselves the power behind their appearance in our language? Well, years ago, I wrote a brief creation myth about the origin of these two powerful essences. Here it is. In the beginning, the divine needed entertainment and sent out a ray of light to stir up something interesting. This light shot out through the universe, dancing and playing in the darkness, not expecting to find anything, but having a grand time turning and spiraling through the cosmos. Soon, pulsating light realized that particles of living matter were collecting wherever it went. When it would spiral off to another spot, the dancing light would, would leave the congealed mass there awaiting its return, but only to find more matter collecting wherever it happened to be and gathered on its newly acquired position. So finally, stri striking up a conversation with the growing forms emerging around it, pulsating light asked the living matter how it came to be floating out here in the darkness. Oh, like you, we are emanations of the divine, said the congealed particles. But we must have movement, and we demand the freedom to move, but we also love form, and we did not know what shape to take until you came with your spiraling light to show us how lovely form is. And now we're in love with our own form and want very much to have both you, dearest light, and our delightful contours. And with that, spiraling light became so attracted to floating forms that it turns and it plunges head forth into them. Wow, what an explosion. What an erotic encounter. And we call this the beginning of life, an encounter of ensouled matter. So that was my creation myth. Um, spirit, spiraling light, attracts mass and takes on form. Spirit becomes ensouled. But by its nature, not wanting to be encumbered because spirit is always trying to get away, because soul things are heavy and cumbersome, spirit wants freedom and flight. So then I wrote a poem about this same encounter. It's called The Dance. Spirit seeks freedom from soul's wrappings and is attempting always to fly away. Soul catches spirit and wraps itself around once again, giving form, color, dimension. Their dance is our chance to watch soul and spirit together in their lovemaking. That was 1992. We live more intimately with this animal presence of snake than any other animal image. That's my claim. Snaky things are everywhere. Snake is nature itself. Wriggling and squirming, twisting and bending, curling and looping back again. Snake is at the portal, kundalini rising, birthing, shedding, death, striking and retreating, transformation, immortality and healing. The Ouroboros is eternity. It's eternity. And it's the continual renewal of life. No wonder Hillman came to see that animals are the divinities, the essences of all there is. 
Recall again what Hellman uh, said, speaking with Thomas More. In most, society, in most societies, the animals were once gods. They were not representations of gods. They were the gods. And he says, remember that most of the Greek gods, goddesses, and heroes had a snake form. The divinity always had a snake form. Zeus, Dionysus, Demeter, Athena, Hercules, Hermes, Hades, and even Apollo. Now with this understanding, let us return to the animal of my paper, the snake. And why is there always a snake in the temple? <laughs> a snake defining the Godhead? Perhaps snake shows the original spirit impregnation from God into matter. Perhaps snake shows the original spirit impregnation from God into matter. The snake shows itself as materialized spirit. We're speaking in this conference of the interrelationships in the world and in the cosmos. Every species has its part to play in the context of cosmic existence. Creation is spawned by many forms. Aboriginal cultures and edgy scientific discoveries alike believe that living forms wriggled their ways through the wormholes from outer space to inhabit our hospitable planet we call Turtle Island. The serpent appears at the moment of creation, spirally Spiraling and interlocking realms, the serpent weaves together one level of reality with yet another. Like the Ouroboros, the snake biting its tail, in the end is its beginning. Snakes are depicted as always being there in the beginning and in the end. In the Garden of Eden, as Ouroboros, the sperm thrusting itself headlong into the egg as the beginning of creation. And once again, at the end of the life cycle, in the form of mites and worms boring through a dead carcass, calling and creating what we call dust to dust. The oldest brain in the human skull is the snake brain. In literature and mythology, snakes are always there in the beginning. Snaky things seem to continue to crawl around in our imagination. We do not know if wormholes exist, although Einstein said and predicted that they do. Some scientists today say we are all connected throughout all space through wormholes because of zero point energy. A wormhole is a, a tunnel through higher dimensions, through space-time into distant parts of the universe. The secret to holding the wormhole open is gravity control, come into substance and form. Now that we know about zero-point energy, we can open wormholes into outer space and into time that is not time. There's a resonance between subtle energies and energies in matter. The 20th century brought us into the awareness that mass and energy are interchangeable. And by what means does the energy, uh, by what means then does the, ener uh, does the universe order itself? There is an archetypal flow and growth form that appears in every form of life as the very basis of nature itself. And that is, of course, the spiral or the vortex ring. <coughs> it's like our DNA. Life energy, what we call matter, is formed through the law of the three forces, pulse, wave, and form. Now, do you recognize this, the law of the three, the trinity? the third thing, suggesting that every phenomena or whatever scale or in whatever world it might take place from molecular to cosmic phenomena is the result of the combination of the meeting of three different forces. I'm claiming pulse, wave, form. 
It is suggested that the two snakes of the caduceus are wave and form generated by pulse. My way of imagining zero-point energy is the hourglass inversion. Vortices in air or water are moving in the same form as the underlying energy and matter coming together, and they exchange energy with, with them. As in a vibrating tuning fork, pulsing from one state to its opposite, from explosion to implosion, from spirit to matter, matter to spirit, the seen to the unseen, and back to the seen a spiraling through the universe as snaky spirit, and adhering to the ad ancient adage, what is above is below, or what is without is within, brings us to the most microscopic interiors of our own bodies, telomeres. The very most recent discovery of extended life depends upon the length of our telomeres, they are snaky-like extensions at the very end of our serpentine-shaped DNA. Telomeres are the guardians at the door of our vital life, our vitality. When the telomeres die, we decline. Now, telomeres are the most recent scientific discovery. Three scientists received the Nobel Prize in 2009 for this discovery that offers new life to old, worn-out DNA sequences. You see this pattern of the Ouroboros? They're microscopically tiny, little, wormy-looking, wiggly things attached to the ends of our serpentine-shaped DNA. Because they die off, they also emit a substance called by scientists telomerase. They can be taken orally. You can take a pill of telomerase to renew your telomeres. So as above, so below, death and rebirth, the most ancient is also the newest discovery giving life. Hillman's chapter three, a snake is not a symbol, calls our attention to, this is his quote, the snake as the inward turning energy that goes back and down and in. Its seduction draws us into darkness and deeps. It is always a both creative, destructive, male, female, poisonous, healing, dry, moist, spiritual, material, and many other irreconcilable opposites, like the figure of Mercurius, who is, of course, the figure of psychology and archetypal psychology. Hillman asks if our interpretations of the snake are none other than the psychological defenses against, and hear this carefully, the presence of a god. Chapter 3. The following are Hillman's own, own words. It is our terror of the snake, the appropriate response. Is, is our terror of the snake the appropriate response of a mortal to an immortal. Hillman's question begs my own query. Is the shudder we experience when we hear the word snake a vibration of fear that is a participation in the ancient confluence of pulse, God, <laughs> wave, spirit, and form? matter. So I see it. Snake. Can you feel the pulse, the wave, and the form? Now I began my talk with a poem in order to get the feeling right, as Hillman suggests in chapter 11 to get us out of our heads and into that sensory awareness of our bodies. D.H. Lawrence's poem helps, and in his poem, Snake, the poet takes us through every level of feeling upon encountering a snake, shock, stillness, awe, reverence, disgust, hatred, revulsion, sympathy, regret, Atonement. Every emotion we as humans have is evoked when we hear the word 
snake. And I want to finish, and I think I have time, I want to finish reading the D.H. Lawrence um, poem. And I'll pick up where I took off. Someone was before me at my water trough, and I, like a second comer waiting, he lifted his head from his drinking, as cattle do, and looked at me vaguely, as drinking cattle do, and flickered his two forked tongue from his lips and mused a moment, and stooped and drank a little more, being earth brown, earth golden from the burning bowels of the earth on the day of Sicilian July with Etna smoking. The voice of my education said to me, he must be killed. For in Sicily, the black, black snakes are innocent, but the gold are venomous. And voices in me said, if you were a man, you would take a stick and break him now and finish him off. But I must confess how I liked him, how glad I was he had come like a guest in quiet to drink at my water trough and depart peaceful, pacified, and thankless into the burning bowels of the earth. Was it cowardice that I dared not kill him? Was it perversity that I longed to talk to him? Was it humility to feel so honored? I felt so honored. And yet, those voices, if you were not afraid, you would kill him. And truly, I was afraid. I was most afraid. But even so, honored still more that he should seek my hospitality from out the dark door of the secret dark earth. He drank enough and lifted his head dreamily as one who has drunken and flickered his tongue like a forked night on the air so black, seeming to lick his lips, and looked around like a god, unseeing, into the air, and slowly turned his head. And slowly, very slowly, as if thrice a dream, proceeded to draw his slow length, curling round and climb again the broken bank of my wall face. And as he put his head into that dreadful hole, and as he slowly drew up, snake-easing his shoulders and entered farther, a sort of horror, a sort of protest against his withdrawing into that horrid black hole, deliberately going into the blackness and slowly drawing himself after, overcame me. Now his back was turned. I looked around, I picked up my pitcher, I put it down, I, I, I grabbed a clumsy log and threw it at the water trough with a clatter. I think it did not hurt him, but suddenly that part of him that was left behind convulsed into undignified haste, writhed like lightning and was gone into the black hole, the earth-lipped fissure in the wall front at which in the intense still noon, I stared with fascination. And immediately, I regretted it. I thought, how paltry, how vulgar, what a mean act. I despised myself and the voices of my accursed human education. And I thought of the albatross, and I wished he would come back, my snake. For he seemed to me again like a king, like a king in exile, uncrowned in the underworld, now due to be crowned again. And so I missed my chance with one of the lords of life, and I have something to expiate, a pettiness. That's D.H. Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you.